Do you want to know why he's not texting you right now? A few months back now, I took a look at a demo build for an upcoming shooter named Mullet Mad Jack. Developed by a crew called Hammer 95, which is made up of literally like three people, it's described as a fast paced FPS that makes you feel like you're inside a classic anime. And when you see footage of this thing in action, you could almost believe it's not even a real game, based off just how insane and wild the whole thing looks. Well, not only is it real, but it's also just hit that coveted 1.0 release on Steam. And it might just feature the absolute best gunplay and overall mayhem you're going to see in a first person shooter in 2024. This was such a pain. Shut up and take my money! This year might have started off a bit rocky with titles like Raven and Phantom Fury, but fans of the shooter genre can rest easy knowing that Mullet Mad Jack is here and it's good. It's pretty damn good. So if all you wanted to know there was whether or not this one is worth your hard-earned dollary dues, well, then let me stop you right there and say, yes, it is. In fact, you know what? Time spent watching me talk about Mullet Mad Jack is time wasted that could be better spent playing Mullet Mad Jack. Technology was the key to freedom. This game is just so badass that during the time I played it, my wife somehow fell pregnant with our second kid. My two-year-old son got a job as a lumberjack, and my bench press and deadlift PRs all tripled. Heh, <laughs> that's the effect that this thing has. But assuming you haven't seen or heard anyone talk about it, well, you're probably wondering what the whole thing's about. Right, so the basic premise is pretty simple to explain. You're a giga chad named Jack with a ridiculously epic mullet, playing the role of a so-called moderator. In a future where AI is taken over, moderators are the only people with enough stones to put these robots out of commission. And at the start of the game, you're soon tasked with rescuing a social media influencer who's been kidnapped by a bunch of these and is being held hostage by the aptly named Mr. Bullethead. <laughs> However, the catch is that your actions are being live streamed, and you've only got 10 seconds to live, with your heart being fueled by the constant dopamine hits you receive after killing robots or by drinking Boomer Soda, which keeps that timer topped up. And then you need to make your way to the top of this building, going through 10 randomly generated floors, moving in a single direction more or less the entire time. Running, jumping, sliding through vents, or while shooting enemies along the way, along with utilizing environmental hazards like fans, exposed electrical panels, and fire extinguishers. And then the 10th floor of every chapter ending in a boss fight, followed by all of your upgrades being removed, but a bunch of permanent upgrades carrying over for subsequent runs. So the overall question then becomes, are you a bad enough dude to save the social media influencer and kill Mr. Bullethead? Go moderate these damn robots! Now a lot of people have compared this thing to Post Void, and in fairness, it is pretty damn similar, with the whole concept being more or less the same in the way that you move in a single direction, shooting at enemies before a timer runs out. At the end of each floor, you choose from a few upgrades, and these stack up as you progress, slowly making you more and more powerful to help you get a leg up for that upcoming boss fight. <laughs> Thank you! Don't go into death. But then the catch is, if you're killed at any time, well then all of your upgrades are gone, and you're thrown right back to the beginning of the current chapter. So yeah, on the surface, these two games have a lot in common. <laughs> Best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today. Visually though, these two couldn't be further apart. And really the first thing that really sticks out here is just how this game looks. Perfectly capturing that 80s and 90s anime aesthetic that you really just don't see in gaming all that much. Almost every single element of the game's visuals are hand-drawn too, you know, by an actual person and not AI, with all of it being sharp, crisp, and vibrant, and there's a real sense of bevelousness to how well the whole thing's been constructed, with just an insane amount of detail in almost every single aspect. If you take the time to stop and look around, you'll see random little easter eggs and references packed into almost every single area. 
The overarching story is really just building upon the whole rescue the social media influencer, and it isn't all that fleshed out, but there's still a bunch of cinematics between each of these chapters that are really fun to watch. There's even a bit of a gotcha moment about halfway through the campaign that genuinely caught me off guard. Plus a really awesome final epilogue sequence ending with the synth ballad as the credits roll. And I mean look, if your 80s or 90s anime influence game doesn't end with rolling credits and a woman on the screen, like, is that really understanding the assignment? More than that as well, like Mullet Mac Jack is just gorgeously violent, letting you vividly see the gruesome demise of all these robots, as Jack shoves a cleaver, a knife or a manga book right through their heads. So overall, like it's just a great looking game, highlighting the absolute talent of the people who've worked on it. I mean, I love this art style so much that I literally commissioned the artist to create the Patreon animation I have at the end of my videos. That's good stuff. Then you got the music on top of all that stuff as well, which is enough to get the blood pumping through the veins in your dick. But then also create this incredibly chilled out vibe, with that main menu theme being the stuff of legends. Which made me realize too that we just don't get enough saxophone solos as we really should. Now controlling Jack is going to feel instantly familiar to people who are into first person shooters. And thankfully there's some really smooth and responsive controls here that quickly become second nature. Aside from moving forward, backwards, strafing side to side and shooting, you've also got to jump, wall run, dash and slide. And the best addition they made since that original demo is that there's now two buttons for dashing and finishing moves. So now if you press shift, you're just going to dash. Whereas if you press the right mouse button, you'll dash, but also use your melee item to execute an enemy. <laughs> Which means you can actually control when and where now you get to use these items, completely alleviating the issue of wasting these when you didn't want to. <laughs> then as you move from chapter to chapter, you'll start to notice how the game is adding in all these new obstacles, bit by bit to ramp up the challenge. <laughs> doesn't provide you with any work rights. I mean, the first episode is pretty basic. You just kind of move in one direction and try to not get killed. And you can really get through most of it by just pressing the W button and the shift button over and over. But by the second episode, the game introduces toxic waste you're going to have to dash over. Then in the third chapter, it starts to introduce gaps you'll need to jump across, along with the inclusion of wall running. After that, you're going to start seeing wall lasers, which you'll need to actively avoid, along with enemies holding right shields that are more resistant to your attacks. One of the enemies that serves as the second chapter boss fight, a so-called zombie with chainsaws for hands, even then becomes a recurring enemy from that point on, and one that's a real thorn in the dick hole as well. And then finally, in the last few chapters, there's spinning ventilation fans along with a new ninja enemy type that's impervious to bullets. The thing is though, for every single one of these new threats, the player's got a way to counter it. I mean, the lasers coming out of the walls, for instance, can simply be dodged, but then also enemies can be kicked into them for an easy kill. As for those guys with the right shields, well, there's an upgrade that lets you pick up that shield and charge forward with it, bulldozing through anything that gets in your way, which is honestly one of the best abilities in the entire game. The ventilation fans do seem kind of frustrating until you realize you can shoot them to momentarily slow them down. And then those weird ghost ninja ladies who have way too much cake, by the way, can be easily dealt with with just a swift kick to the face. Yeah, truly a universal solution to many of life's problems. <laughs> so it's like they never introduce some kind of bullshit hazard or a threat that the player is completely outmatched by or has no means to defend themselves from. In fact, almost every single attack in this game can be avoided. Enemies armed with pistols or shotguns, for instance, aren't hit scanning. So if you keep mobile and don't run in a straight line like a complete idiot, it's entirely possible to clear entire rooms and floors without ever taking a hit. 
if you're watching someone play this, like, it can kind of look like they're just mindlessly just mashing the dash button and shooting at everything that moves. And yeah, like, maybe most people might be doing that. But if you take the time to even quickly survey your options in every room, even just minor things like grabbing items or random soda cans when you might not need them, it's going to have a huge effect on how you play overall. And then factor in as well that better accuracy earns better rewards, with headshots, nut shots, and environmental kills granting back more time as well. It all just kind of comes together to make Mullet Mad Jack more than just a mindless shooter. Almost kind of makes it a bit like a game of chess, you know what I mean? Just one that's very violent and soaked in blood. As for the actual weapons, well, there's a whole bunch of guns here to use as well, from the starting revolver right through to an assault rifle and a rail gun. And like all the other upgrades, these pop up at random at the end of each floor. <laughs> Now initially your guns are only going to be level 1, but there's also level 2 and level 3 variants able to be unlocked. And you'll just be getting better versions of the same guns, which does things like removing magazine limitations so you can just fire endlessly without ever having to reload. Well, with that third level for the shotgun for instance, you can load up to 4 shells at once before firing. Yeah, I mean, what is this, ultra kill? <sighs> The good thing too is that once you've leveled up a weapon three times, that upgraded version is the one you're always going to see in the store. So there is a bit of a benefit there early on in trying to max all of these out. Even just Jack's starting revolver is surprisingly effective though, and one that you could easily beat the entire game with, especially when you don't have to worry about the handicap of having to reload. The shotgun, on the other hand, is a little bit trickier to begin with, mainly because it doesn't have that same range as the revolver does. But then the advantage there is that you don't really need to be as accurate, and simply aiming that shotgun in the general direction of whatever you want killed is a perfectly viable strategy. Aside from that, there's also the railgun and the plasma rifle, and using both of these does make the game feel like you've suddenly switched to easy mode, simply because the railgun kills most enemies in a single hit. And then the plasma rifle does so much damage that it may as well have a pacifier connected to it. When you upgrade both of these to level 3, you can pretty much just fire them over and over without ever having to reload. And from that point on, you really have to screw up on purpose to be killed. And ignoring the slight chance of an epileptic fit you're going to get from firing the plasma rifle full auto, there's really not any downside to using either of these. What is definitely one of the trickier weapons to use here are the katanas, with there being a fire and ice variant. And the difference there being that the ice sword seems to freeze enemies when they're hit by it, whereas the fire sword, I don't know, I guess burns them. But either way, like enemies hit by the katanas still die in a single hit regardless, so it's kind of redundant. Anyway, the reason I say that these are a bit trickier is that when you're using them, you're obviously forced into engaging with enemies at point-blank range. You know, because they're katanas. The 4 release has added in the option though to throw out katanas from a distance, which is honestly a bit of a godsend, and it does alleviate some of the frustration of having to close that gap towards someone on the other side of a room, knowing otherwise you are probably going to take a hit in the process. So, this is without a doubt, I think, the most skill-based weapon in Jack's arsenal, but also one of the most satisfying when you get the hang of it. And if you were like me and studied the blade while everyone else was out partying, then this right here, man, is the weapon of choice. And about all that's missing is letting Jack dress up in an ankle-high trench coat. And then rounding everything out, there's the submachine gun, which is really the only weapon I just didn't find all that good. And the reason there is, is that the recoil while firing this thing is still really difficult to control. But more than that, like it just never felt like it was doing all that much damage. Even when I'd finally gotten that level 3 upgrade, which for some reason has Jack holding it to the side like some kind of gangster, it still seems to take way more shots than it should to even down the basic enemies. Whereas I could just simply plant a couple of shots in someone's head with a revolver or the shotgun and call it a day, the submachine gun always had me lingering just that little bit longer in a room before moving on. And I just found that, again, like that early demo build, this is the weapon I seem to die with the most. Apart from that, there's also like a couple of hidden weapons as well, like an assault rifle, which functions, you know, about how you'd expect it to. And after you finish the game, you'll unlock the handgun. Yeah, a literal handgun. I don't know, I guess someone's been playing a lot of Dead Space 2. <laughs> 
despite being a pretty hardcore experience, Mullet Mahajack is also a surprisingly accessible game, with a bunch of different difficulty modes that affect a variety of factors, from the amount of time you get back from enemy kills, even due to the amount of soda machines and melee items. There's even one difficulty mode in there that removes that timer completely, you know, in case you just want to take things at your own pace. See you later! But I did feel that playing through the story on the challenge mode, which is the so-called intended difficulty, really was the best way to experience the whole thing. And the reason for that was that although you are going to die a hell of a lot here, often to the point that it just becomes infuriating, it is by and large the best way to actually get better at the game. Because this is a mode that really forces you to utilize all of the different mechanics, instead of just constantly running forward, shooting over and over, and hoping for the best. I mean, I hit an absolute snag around like the fifth floor or so, where my brain just couldn't adapt to what was going on. It just really got to the point there where I was replaying these same few areas over and over, that I started to recognize the layouts for all of these rooms, and more importantly, remember things like where soda cans or those melee weapons were going to be placed, which means that I could use these at all the right times when I needed to. And you would kind of think that the best way to play this game is to be as fast as possible, but I actually found that taking a somewhat slower, more methodical approach was a lot safer in the long run. <laughs> because you can easily get that timer back up again with a well-placed execution. But if you just go running room to room without really analyzing what's going on, well, you're gonna lose a whole lot more time in the long run if you have to restart. Dad? It's just the kind of game that really rewards you the more you play it. And once all the elements come together and you get that build going that works perfectly, dominating all of these robotic ass wipes and tearing the boss in your shithole, I mean, there's really nothing else quite like it. I'd have to think too that trying to walk the line between being hard but not too hard for all this stuff must just be an absolute balancing nightmare. And it really is a fine line here between making the game ball crushingly hard, but also keeping that challenge fun and enticing. You know, so you don't just rage quit after the first 15 minutes. Having said that though, like even after getting stuck on that fifth chapter for what felt like hours, dying over and over for a whole bunch of reasons, I gotta say man, I kept coming back time and time again. You know, like a good little bitch. And then eventually it all just seemed to click and I had that near flawless run and moved on to the next episode. And that right there is what makes Mullet Mad Jack so good. I mean, any game can pummel you into the ground over and over, but the ones that have you come back for more, even when you're battered and bruised, are the ones that are clearly doing something right with the core gameplay loop. The only thing that I really have any kind of legitimate issue with is the seventh chapter, with the premise for this one being that the power's out on all of these 10 floors, which results in playing through this entire episode in the dark, which poses some serious accessibility issues. I mean, to put it simply, the visual of a dark image combined with constantly flashing lights, like, it doesn't really lend itself all that well to sustained play, especially if you're prone to getting motion sickness from that kind of thing. And even in that brief time that I spent with this chapter, I left it with a pretty bad headache. I do also think the game is a bit light on boss fights, and there's a couple of chapters here and there where we don't even really get one at all. The end of one chapter is a sniper battle against a bunch of enemies on the other side of a building, and then for narrative reasons, other chapters lack proper boss fights too. As for the ones we do get, well, these are also pretty damn easy as well. And I mean, you might die here like once or twice while you're trying to learn the patterns, but none of them are likely to have you coming back a dozen times to beat. You're still going to be spending far more time here trying to just get to the fight itself. You know, tackling that RNG for each run, more than you are going to be spending hours learning the best possible strategies against all of these bosses. The best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today. Final boss fight, for instance, I beat on the first attempt. And then there's a sequence after that where it keeps going, which is even easier. Though I will say that that whole sequence is more for the spectacle than anything else. It is worth noting too that there is that whole super hardcore permadeath mode as well. So I don't know, I mean, I guess complaining about the difficulty when I'm only playing on the intended mode is probably a bit dumb. Oh yeah, and also too, after you beat the campaign, you unlock Endless Mode, which, true to its namesake, is just an endless series of floors, where every 10th floor you lose a second off your maximum time. But now you have 8 seconds! So yeah, dog, like properly beating Mullet Mad Jack on all of these modes is going to be no small feat. The other thing that I didn't really vibe with is all of the random one-liners they've now given to Jack. 
Mullet power. This is where at random you'll hear him spout off bits of dialogue like a quick insult or a tongue-in-cheek remark. And I get it, it's supposed to be a throwback to the shooters of the 1990s with guys like Duke Nukem and Caleb who commented on the player's actions throughout combat. I get it. Damn, I'm good. The only thing is that this guy's literally introduced as the strong and silent type. Hmm, he sounds like a strong silent type. With the intro cinematic almost over animating his expressions in lieu of hearing him talk. So to then have him suddenly saying these cheesy lines of dialogue during the gameplay, it just kind of seems out of place. Billionaires do not care. Plus it arguably kind of ruins the ending in a way too. And without really spoiling anything, there's a bit at the end there where the influencer says something to Jack which causes him to burst out in laughter. <laughs> With the punchline obviously supposed to be the fact that it's the first time we've actually heard the guy emote or make any real kind of noise. Only that's all but ruined because we've had to hear his random little thoughts interjected over the last few dozen levels. I will admit it's more of a subjective complaint, but it just kind of feels to me like it's something they put in recently because, I don't know, they thought they had to. <laughs> Either way though, that doesn't change the fact that Mullet Mad Jack is one of the best shooters to come out in recent memory. And despite having a pretty small scope and a campaign that'll only take you maybe 6 or 7 hours, not to mention what appears to be a simple gameplay loop, there is actually a surprisingly deep and rewarding experience to be found here. And I would have absolutely no issues recommending this game to anyone who's a fan of the genre, but more than that, to people who are fans of things that are just fun in general. <laughs> it's like, hey, do you like shooting stuff? You do? Well, then I've got the game for you, bitch. And sometimes all you really want to do is run around and violently murder robots for the greater good. That greater good being to rescue a social media influencer who's probably going to forget your name before the day's done. Sounds like you're in trouble. At a time when we're usually waiting years for an FPS game to come to fruition, only for it to be a complete disappointment, we end up getting something like this that comes out in a fraction of the time and also manages to deliver the goods on launch. And more importantly, without having to point fingers or blame a bunch of YouTubers either. So you see, can be done. And you know what's even better is that we've still got Solarco to look forward to as well. So this month, shooter fans are eating real good. Ha, 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 ha.